James chapter 1, please. James chapter 1. I am still in that uh, improving process, actually. I've, uh, pu- I've built up the challenge uh, steeper and steeper. So I think I met my match. <laughs> this is hopefully the last step that I'll climb over. So, so th- I've raised the bar to another level, and hopefully this will be my last. And then I'll get used to this style of preaching. All right, I'm going to give you a textual message in this passage. Let's look at James chapter 1, and we'll read verse 2. James chapter 1, we'll read verse 2. Uh, If there's something in my part that may not be as great of a sermon, I hope that nevertheless you'll still get something out of it, or something the Lord can use it to speak to you. Amen. James chapter 1, and we'll read verse 2. The apostle James is writing to the 12 tribes of Israel that are scattered abroad. There's a lot of tribulation language over here. John is with the knowledge of the doctrine of the tribulation as he writes to the 12 tribes of Israel scattered abroad. Knowing that tribulation means trial, it means suffering, his epistle would obviously address all of those painful things. And his attitude and his solution is as follows at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when he fall into divers temptations. Well, that is easier said than done. How can a person take trial and pain with a joyful attitude? Trial is not joyful, it is sorrowful. There is vexation and misery. However, the Christian attitude, just like how James wrote to those Jews, is to have a joyful heart no matter how bad life is. Because it is of God's intention that whether good or bad or mediocre, the point is no matter what point in life that you have the joy of the Lord. That's the thing that's most coveted after that everybody is chasing after that no one seems to attain except Bible-believing Christians who have discovered it through His Word. Did you discover it yet through His Word or you're still learning it? I'm still in the learning process myself. However, I do have a better grasp of it uh, now compared to back then. And I hope that this message will speak to you on painful situations you go through, yet you can accept it. Yet you can live with it. That the pain will never go away, perhaps, but it's something that you can use for the glory of God. That you can still find the color of that rainbow after that uh, storm and that cloud, you'll see something, a glimmer of hope shining down on you. I hope that you can see that with your life as I preach this message. The title of my message is a hard title to accept. Accept your pain. Let's pray. Uh, Father, will you fill in me the power of your Holy Spirit? As everyone believes in their hearts and as a brother prayed, it doesn't matter how much effort I put into this. It'll all come to nothing without you. Lord, I've done what I could. Will you fill within me the rest? May it preach. May it convict. Give it power, Lord. And not just uh, through your preaching, but to the preacher. And not just to the preacher, but the hearers. Because uh, if any one of these things is out of sync, then the person cannot be helped. So you'll have to fill within all those uh, areas, and it's not a problem for you. You're a powerful God, Heavenly Father. Uh, I cannot bring it all about, Lord. I completely yield to thy spirit and cleanse my sins with your blood and use me. Cleanse all these people's sins with your blood and use them. Fill within everyone and every ounce of this message and every word that is preached and every feeling and heartbeat and every thought and every moment with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. My first point is the sympathy, the sympathy. Notice that James addresses my brethren as he writes out this verse. You can see that there is a sympathetic tone as he words it out that way. Now, Why would he write down, my brethren? Shouldn't the verse be able to work without those words, my brethren? It should still work. It should still work if you read verse 2, count it all joy when he fall into diverse temptations. 
The main point of the message is still carried across. Basically, have a joyful attitude no matter how bad life is. You hear that from the preaching of the Word of God that you're supposed to have a joyful attitude. You're supposed to rejoice in the Lord and that no matter how bad the trial is, that you are to be happy in Jesus Christ. Now, you hear these statements and those things should work. It's pretty odd that you would insert my brethren there. Those statements, those sermons should be able to work without my brethren. Why would James start out that way, my brethren? Because it shows that he cares. As he tells you to rejoice in the Lord, no matter how trial and suffering goes. No matter how the preaching of the word of God gets to you, it is true that God says you're to be happy in Jesus Christ. You're to rejoice ever more. You're supposed to praise during persecution and that you're supposed to look up for your reward is in heaven. But I'm so glad to know that when God says these things, he's not just saying these things to me to convict me or to even encourage me. But more so when he says these statements, he says these statements with my child. My brethren, because as he says all those words, it's to show that he cares when he says that. Not just to convict you, not to, just to inspire you, not just to motivate you, but to show that I care for you. A lot of times we go through beat up situations, we beat up ourselves. And then a lot of situations and fellow people beat us down. It's really good to know that when we go through trial, we don't think God is beating us down. God's not looking down on you and saying, hey, you should be stronger. God's not looking down on you and say, hey, you should know better. God's not looking down on you and saying, hey, you should look up and rejoice. What's the matter with you? Instead, God's like, no, I care. And I understand of the pain you're going through. And I care about you, my child. But that's why I rebuke you and I chasten you. Do you see the difference with that one? There's a total difference when he starts out that way because it makes us receive that rebuke. It makes us receive that chastisement more when we know that he cares. Let me repeat that again. Can't you sense and see that you can receive the rebuking and chastening more when he tells you, when you know he cares for you? My child. I love you. That's why you must receive this rebuke. Isn't that much of a difference compared to you need to receive this rebuke? You need to receive this chastisement. It makes a whole level of difference with my brethren. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Why in the world would James say, my brethren? Did you, do you picture James as the disciple who, as a rough fisherman, and then, you know, beating people up and want, wanting to cut people's heads off, he goes to the people and say, my brethren. <laughs> no, nah, it doesn't fit James' style. It doesn't fit his personality. He would probably gross out, you know. You would never say those words. Why in the world would James all of a sudden, you know, you think, what's the matter with you, James? Just say, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Why do you have to go with my brethren, you know? Why do you have to start out with that kind of a sissy, weak attitude? That's what James would probably think and feel. I wonder who he learned it from. Maybe he recalls an experience as he walked and talked with Jesus Christ, what Jesus said. If we look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 46, notice from this story. While he yet talked to the people, Jesus talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Okay, so if your mom and your family is about to come to you, obviously, I mean, you'd run to meet them. You'd greet them. You'd say, man, it's so good to see you. I love you. Well, Jesus Christ, look at this. Verse 47, Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak thee. 
If any of you told me my mother is just outside with my family and they want to talk to me, I mean, because I love my family, I'd go out and talk to them. Verse 48, apparently not Jesus. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Can you imagine that? If you're the mother waiting for your child and you want to talk to that child because it's been a long time. Hey, Jesus, you know, it's been three and a half years and you've been homeless and you haven't seen me. And man, we traveled all this way over here just to see you. And then the audacity of your son saying, who's my mom? Makes you want to slap him. <laughs> well, Jesus, he's holy. He's without sin. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's the intention here? If there's one thing you know about your God, he doesn't say anything or do anything without any plan or purpose right. or reason. Right. So Jesus doesn't just end it at verse 48. He continues. Verse 49, And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven... The same as my brother and sister and mother. Because Jesus wanted to drive a point across. It's not because he hated his mom and his family. But rather that he wanted to point out to the people. Look at this situation right here. I'm trying to point out to you that these people who love the Lord, who are saved Christians, who are saved believers that they're more important than physical flesh and blood yes. to me. Amen. Now, Jesus called them my mother, my sister, and my brother. Maybe that's why the passage is proven more true that if you cannot hate mother, father, sister, your own life also, you cannot be my disciple. Not in the sense that you're supposed to hate them, but that rather because you love this spiritual family so much, you love God so much, that the love you have for them compared with the love for your physical family, the gap is so great that it actually looks like hatred. So it's not that you hate your physical family, but rather the gap of the two loves is so great that the level is so great it's like hatred. That's the idea to understand. And Jesus wanted us to understand that that's how much he loves us. You know what Jesus is trying to tell you? You know why he said that? He's trying to get your attention, that's why. The ones who are reading this verse right now. He's trying to get your attention by saying, do you get it yet? Compared to my mom that any normal person would love more, I love you more. Wow. Thank you more. Did, that, did that click in your head yet? Wow. Did that click in your head yet on how much God really loves you and cares for you? And James understood that. The value of love for a spiritual family is that strong. That bond is so strong. Let me even raise it up a level higher. When God saw Jesus Christ tortured on a bloody cross and whipped and beaten up, you think he was happy, he was joyful? Or do you think, man, can you imagine all that wrath of God? And all the angels and the disciples and everybody just throw down the hammer. Make them stop torturing Jesus Christ. Don't you think that the Father up in heaven would do this? He his only son. His only son he ever had. Being tortured and beaten up. Any child would get upset. Any child would run and defend. Any uh, parent any parent will feel heartbroken. Any parent will feel grieved and hurt. Can you imagine God the Father, how much grief he felt when his own son, only begotten son, was suffering that? Do you realize that God's love toward his only begotten son goes through suffering and pain? Is that much cared for and grieved? It's the same toward you? It is the same toward you. You don't believe me? Jesus said at John 17, the love that you've given to me, give it to them. Why? Because, my friend, I know you're not the son of God. And that's why Jesus has that special exception of having uh, more love, it seems like. But you are still a son. Yes. 
of God. You're still his son. You're still his child. And that father and son relationship is there. That when the son, he sees his child suffering, any parent's heart would be wrenched and torn and grieved as that child is going through suffering and pain. It's good to know that when God tells you to endure, you must be strong and have faith that I'll work it all out. At the same time, his heart is also that strong towards you and he cares about you as you go through suffering. He's not just telling you to go through suffering, go through suffering. When he tells you to go through suffering, his heart beats for you at the inner depths as much as he beat it for his son who was suffering. As, you, as his son was taking up the cross, so aren't we supposed to take up our crosses? And would not God the Father's heart beat the same as he did to Jesus Christ as he took up his cross with us when we take up our cross to follow him? Yes, he loves you. It's good to know that. That's what makes the pain more receptive, more bearable is that I know he loves me. He cares about me. He's not just going up in heaven and thinking that this is all a game. We know all these sufferings and these bad things have to happen. It's not God's will that all this happens. It has to happen because of our choice, our decision, and our sin. And so any bad thing that just comes out, it'll have to come out. That's a consequence of sin. So that's why things have to go that way, bad things. It's not because of God, it's because of our wickedness and our sin. But thank God that he didn't just leave us to the, our own sin and let us taste our own medicine. But rather, you know, I really care about you. It hurts me when you suffer, when you're in tears, when you're in pain. And me, I can't annihilate the suffering because sin must be paid for. But you know what? Because I'm a genius, I can somehow turn that into something good. So that's why you can receive that pain and go through it. It's not fun for you, I know, child, but I want you to know it's not fun for me either. And I love you and I care for you and then we can go through it together. Let's do it. That's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. My second is the stance. The stance. Let's look at the next part of James chapter 1 and verse 2. James chapter 1 and verse 2. Notice that the second part of verse 2, it says... Count it all joy. Count it all joy. James took the stance that no matter how bad the trial and suffering is, we are to count it as joyful, as something we should be happy about. When we have that stance, then we're able to endure through suffering. When we have a stance like that, we're able to be happy. Without such a stance where you count it all joy, James never said it is joyful. No, it's never joyful. You have to count it. You have to count it all joy. See, you have to have a stance, a position, a viewpoint during suffering. If you have no belief, no viewpoint during suffering, suffering is never joyful to you. But to have a belief and a viewpoint during the midst of suffering, you can make it joyful. Where's your viewpoint during suffering? What's your belief during suffering? Or you have none. No wonder it's miserable for you. The necessity of a stance so that you can be happy as you go through hard times. I wonder what James meant by count it all joy. How can you get a stance like that? Well, the author, the only time he would mention count it joyful in this epistle is given at the last chapter. Let's go to James 5. Let's see what James would drive at, what he means by that, count it joy. He explains it a little bit further at James 5, verse 11. James 5, 11. He says it again, count it joy. But look at right here. Behold, we count them happy. There he goes again. And the topic is about trial. We count them happy which what? Endure. You know why you can count it happy? If you have strong endurance. Have you ever seen people who haven't been like as much of strong fitness or endurance 
that they have a tendency to lack more energy. They have a tendency where things hurt them more easily. But a person who is more strong and more fit has more energy and more resistance against hurt. The point is, you can resist hurt better when you have strength. But if there is no strength, and it's not just these big hurts will hurt you, it's even the smallest things that shouldn't hurt anyone will even hurt you. And that's why there's a, such a thing called sensitive people. And this generation has undoubtedly increased a thousand times full more in sensitivity because there is no strength within our generation today. Instead, we have been in a phase, we have lived a whole life taking everything for granted and expectations should be even more. I expect more. I expected more. I expected more. Because of that, there is no stop. There is no boundary line. And you're getting weaker and weaker. No wonder that it's mind-boggling how suicide is still so high in spite of how much stuff you get. And that the Hollywood stars who should have everything think they don't have everything and commit suicide still. Why is that? They don't have strength. Strength is so important because that strength gives you energy. It gives you resistance against the pain. That way the pain don't really hit you as much or as hard. That's why it's so important to build up strength, to have endurance. A person who has endured so many trials for the Lord Jesus Christ, you will notice that they're able to resist hurt and pain better than other people who have never endured. And that's what you're going to notice right there. They have a resistancy that's stronger, an ability that's stronger. If there's one thing that you'd like in life, it's to be able to resist depression. Wouldn't anyone want that? Wouldn't anyone want to resist misery? Yes. That horrible feeling inside that's gutting you down and dragging you low? Wouldn't anyone want, hey, if there's a power like that, if there's something like that, I want you to put that in me. You can. You need yes. to endure then. Yes. If you are to endure, you can have that power within. <coughs> we must endure through hardship in order to develop happiness in life. But happiness cannot be built when we expect everyone and everything to give us all our expectations because there's no such thing like that. And good luck with that. Good luck with chances happening that every day in your life. That's why it's so important to build up that endurance against depression, loneliness, sorrow, complaint, and bitterness. And when that endurance is built up, you're able to resist it better. And you'll be able to protect your joy. You're able to protect your energy. You're able to protect your stamina. But it's being attacked because you haven't built it up with endurance. When you go through pain, it's so important that you have to learn to accept it. When you feel that pain in you, you got to learn, how can I accept it? How can I make it more bearable? Amen. Amen. And you've got to have that willingness of heart to receive it while opening your eyes and ears as the Lord teaches you a lesson and you learn finally. And as you learn more and more, it could be through the preaching of the Word of God, it could be your own Bible reading, it could be just going through that experience, yeah. but then you finally go through a learning moment. Once you learn that, your mind and body remembers. Then you need to learn to adapt to it. I mean, isn't that what evolutionists have always talked about? You know, how do you have survival of the fittest? They don't just whine and expect, you know, oh, I'm going to die. Everything should be handed out to me. No, you know, what they do is that you got to learn to adapt, to, to survive, to resist. So even atheists would agree with what I'm talking about right here. That in order to retain joy, you've got to learn to receive it and how to adapt to it. And then when you adapt to it, you got to learn, how can I make it into a joyful thing? 
You can't just think of it as doom and gloom. If God promised all things work together for good, it's supposed to turn out for something good. Why not utilize that and see, what can I use this bad thing for something as actually a benefit to my life? You complain about the long drive to church? Why don't you, 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 why don't you utilize that to finally play the Bible and then hear, read more, hear and read more chapters of the Bible? Yes. Utilize something bad for something good out of your life. It turns into a joyful thing instead. Yes. Yes. You must take every bad scenario and situation in life and that's how the endure, you got to endure. You got to endure. No one likes endurance, but trust me, when you build up that endurance, you'll be happy. Amen. And temptation and trial and hardship and pain, when they hit you, won't hit you as That depression won't build. You're not giving it, it an opportunity to build. That's it. Right there. Right. Right there. But I'll tell you what, if you keep uh, resisting the pain... Okay, if you keep trying to run away from the pain rather than accepting it, it's going to make it harder. Yes, that's right. It makes things harder. It makes the pain really hurtful. It makes the pain really bigger than you. But to accept it, to adapt to it, to become one with that pain and then learn how to control that and utilize it for the good and the glory of God, you're able to have joy in your life just makes it harder. It just hurts even more if you resist it. When there's a baby who is struggling to walk, the baby's not happy about that when it's being forced to walk. Who wants to, <laughs> who wants to learn how to walk? Which, wh which baby would want to learn how to walk? So then, what you have to do with that baby who's struggling to walk, you give the baby an incentive. You wave a nice little toy in front of the baby. You wave, you know, something delicious that the baby would want to eat. And you say, look at this right here. When you do that, the baby is like, oh, and then starts tr trying to walk toward that thing. And then as you hold the baby's hands, and then the baby is forcing himself to walk. But I thought the baby didn't like the struggle. I thought the baby didn't want to think about the struggle. That's the thing, the baby is not thinking about the struggle. The baby's not seeing the struggle. All the baby is seeing is, I want that prize. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. If there's one thing that you can see from Jesus Christ's life, life as he went through pain, as he went through the struggle, he was not looking or thinking about the pain. He was able, the Bible says, to have joy. But how can you have joy? The verse says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that what? That was set before him. What's the next part? Endured the cross. That's how you can build up that endurance. That's how the endurance builds, is that when the joy is literally like that baby, that joy, that thing you're so happy about, is set right in front of your face. And then what you're doing, all you're doing is you're trying to get there. All you're doing when you're looking at the joy is trying to reach it. And you're not thinking about is, oh, how far away, oh, this hurts, oh, I don't want it. Oh, give it to me. Well, I'm not going there until you get it to me. No, if you, if you like that joy, you want it that bad, all you're thinking about is, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. I want it. I want it that bad. And look at that. You're walking through the pain without thinking about it. That's how you maintain that joy. That's how you count it joy during struggle and trial is all you're thinking about is the pride, the joy. I mean, if you were to think about if God told you, if God told you, I mean, for some of you who went through this, you've seen how God blessed your life after the trial. If God showed you that blessing and put it right in front of your face, that, hey, I know you don't want to go through that trial, but this is what's going to come out. Your family member is going to get saved. This is what's going to happen is, uh, I'm going to bless your life even physically more. 
look at this, this good thing's gonna happen. If God literally put that right in front of your face, then you know what you and I would do. We go, okay, I'm gonna go through this. It's just a, I gotta go through this couple more weeks, months, you know, I'm gonna get that thing. But the thing is you don't put it before you. You don't put that joy before you. You know what you put before you? Pain. You put pain before you. Who wants to go there? Who wants to receive it? No one would. But why is it important to receive pain? Not because, oh, I want pain that badly. No, you have to receive pain because I got to walk through this. That's why I have to receive this pain. I got to walk through this so I can get what I actually want. That prize, that joy. Do you set it before your eyes? Do you set it before your eyes through every teardrop, through every trial and pain and sorrow, the depression? All you're seeing is that bleak darkness or that hope, that joy in front of your face. It endures then. You endure like a baby enduring through that struggle without thinking about it, without feeling it just, oh, I want that. I want that that I guess your problem is maybe you don't believe that joy exists right maybe your problem is all you're looking at is down when you're trying to get that blessing not up let's look at Luke 9 Luke 9 I wonder how James was able to maintain this stance about looking at the joy when bad things happen. Because James certainly didn't have that. I mean, if you know this epistle, it's about the persecution. And actually, during his time, he was undergoing persecution by Saul and the Jews. Now, if you recall James' attitude back then, if those Jews were to put a hand on Jesus or on him, he'd take out a sword and cut their head off. He wouldn't say, oh, I received the persecution. Go ahead, beat me. No, he said, no, I'll beat you if you touch me. Yeah. You know? so why the sudden change? Well, maybe he understood back then what happened. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 52. And sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So notice right here that Jesus and the disciples want to go through Jerusalem. But then the Samaritan says, you know, you're not going to go through here because you're going to go through Jerusalem. So James said, well, rejoice in the Lord always. And the Bible says when we undergo persecution, yea, that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution all right, let's go. No, he said this in the very next verse, verse 54. And when his disciples, James and, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned, <laughs> Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. You know, James and John, they weren't like, let's endure persecution. No, they said, Lord, let's command fire to come down out of heaven and consume them. They had it their way. They called down fire from heaven and consumed them. If they had it their way, thank God they didn't have it their way. Jesus stopped them and said, you have no idea what spirit you had. Just saying that. You know, why, why did James and John say, let's call down fire from heaven? You don't just call down fire from heaven. Yeah. There's something why they would call down fire from heaven. Look at that verse again, why they would, why they would. Verse 54, and when his disciples, James and John, what? Saw this. Because James and John saw the pain, the persecution of those Samaritans, of how they mistreated Jesus Christ and them. Because all they saw was that. What happened was they had no idea, but they just had an attitude. Let's just consume them with fire. And Jesus said, you know, it, it's sad, but you don't even know 
what kind of spirit just possessed you now? You know what the problem is when we see the pain in our life? When we see the pain in our life, what happens is we have no idea what kind of spirit can really possess us that moment. As you're in the middle of that darkness and in that pain, guess what? You either can go up and God can give you, really, give you a greater light or you can go into greater depths of darkness. When you're in that uh, middle of the road, in that decision in life, I choose God or I choose to reject God, you got to realize it's a better thing in life you can either go towards or a darker thing in life. Amen. You have no Amen. idea what spirit will possess wow. you when you keep seeing that trouble in your life. And that spirit, that decision that will control your life, and that dark spirit that makes you make decisions that you thought you would never make, that dark spirit that will make you think such thoughts that you thought you would never think of. Wow. That dark spirit that would make you do something that nobody would understand and say, why would you even do that? That's what happens when you keep seeing the pain. And you have no idea how dark and how evil and how scary that spirit can be that will possess your life. Amen. Amen. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible when all you see is pain rather than the joy, all you see is pain rather than the joy, it's impossible to keep that all in. It's impossible to keep that all in without the Spirit possessing you, and you eventually invoke fire, and you want to call down fire from heaven on someone. You ever seen somebody who goes through a lot of stress, and they never lashed out at you, of course, right? Or did they lash out at you before? You ever seen someone lash out at you because they went through a lot of stress, a lot of pain? Why? They undergo something strenuous that made them as if they want to call down fire on you. It's impossible. I warned you again. It's impossible when you see pain and all you see is pain rather than joy. It's impossible you're not going to eventually call down fire on someone that you love in your life. Someone close to you in your life. Some people around you in your life. You have no idea. You have no idea. You don't know what manner of spirit can possess your life. But you know, it's, uh, it's not just somebody else. It's even God. You'd even call down fire from heaven upon God. You know that? You have no idea you know not what manner of spirit can possess you wow. as you're in that dark painful moment and all you see is that rather than the joy that not just only you'd lash out at someone and call down fire on someone but rather on god wow. lord you're horrible lord you're not true lord i wish you didn't exist ask atheists who you claim that they used to be christians yeah. their whole life is dedicated to fire down on God. Yep. Committed. Their religion is committed to rain down fire against God. Yep. Yep. Ask these atheists how they end up that way. They'll mention, because God wasn't there for me during suffering. Because my mom died of cancer. Because I saw my own only child die suffering a horrible disease. You know why? All they saw was pain, yeah. not the joy, uh -huh. not the great God that could use it. Yes. You know, ye know not what manner of spirit can possess you. Can I tell you one more thing that you can call down fire upon? You wouldn't believe it. Yourself. Yeah. That's right. Yourself. Because you just have to call down fire on someone. So you can't do it against your wife, your husband, your child. You can't lash out at them. And you can't do it at God because it's blasphemy. So the only person you can lash out is yourself. Oh, you stupid you. Oh, I hate my life. I'm just a wreck. I want to commit suicide. End it all. The saddest thing is You'd call down fire on yourself. Why? Because all you see is pain. 
It's impossible to call down fire on yourself, on someone else, or on God until you see the pain first. And all you see is pain. Where's your joy? Where's the joy? Do you see joy? That's why when you don't come to church, you know all you're seeing? So much time in that dark little hole called pain. But when you come here, God's trying to put joy in front of your face. He's trying to put joy in front of your face right now in the preaching. He's trying to put joy in front of your face in the singing. He's trying to put joy in front of your face through the fellowship and love of the brother. He's trying to put the joy in front of your face. But when you don't spend so much time seeing that, then all you see is pain. And then you will invoke fire upon someone you love in your life, someone close to you, and even your, upon God himself. You wouldn't hesitate to dishonor him, to blaspheme him, and call down fire on him. And just even upon yourself, your own life, just end it all. Because you're just that much miserable. It was joy. It was joy. My third point is the stumbling. The stumbling. Let's look back at James again. Please look back at James 1, 2 again. Please look at James 1, 2 again. Notice that the next part right here, it says, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall. When ye fall. <laughs> That's not an encouraging word right there. When ye fall. When, uh, didn't the Bible, you know, the last time I read my Bible, James, I wonder if James ever read his Bible. He probably never read his Bible. And he was told to write a book of the Bible. It, it, James, did you ever read the Bible when it talks about a Christian falling, that it's a negative thing? T uh, Wherefore, let him that thinks he standeth take heed lest he fall. That's what the verse says. The Bible says, uh, ye that are fallen from grace. You think that's a blessing? That's a positive thing? Even the Bible, where it says a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, the falling is not positive. It's not a good note. It's the rising. If God never put uh, the rising part, a just man falleth seven times, period, you think that's a blessing? <laughs> Unless he puts a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, right? Do you follow what I'm saying? The point is, why would James put... When you fall, that, that's a big blessing. He didn't read his Bible, man. You know, I looked at every verse, and I could be wrong. So I could be wrong about this. But I think nearly every verse in the Bible that talks about a person, specifically a person himself or herself, that falls, it's a negative reference. Nothing good except this verse. This is the only verse that talks good about when a person falls. You might say, why is that? Well, I think James is trying to point out right here, when you fall, what does that mean? You don't get up. When you fall, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you, uh, you take caution so that you can prevent yourself from falling. It never said that. It just shows you drop. When you drop, you just drop. Nothing you can do about it. Look at Acts 12. Look at this, Acts 12. Acts 12. Acts chapter 12. Uh, now, preacher, I thought that there's something that we got to do so that we can resist, so that we don't, we can overcome this depression, this pain. Yeah, but I, you didn't hear the full picture yet. This is something you need to hear. You need to learn that you need to fall so that you can accept the pain. Look at Acts 12. Acts 12. Now, tell me if you see anything good in this passage. Now, remember, James is the writer of the book of James, right? Uh, for some of you who didn't know, we Bible believers believe that it's uh, John's brother James, not James the Lord's brother, who wrote the epistle of James. So James wrote that knowing about the suffering and persecution he underwent. And he says, hey, be happy when you go through temptation and trial. How come I don't see that here? Look at Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to what? Vex certain of the church. Certain of the church. What does vex mean? To make you happy? Trouble. To satisfy you? 
It means to trouble you. It means to annoy you. It means to make you miserable. It doesn't mean joy. Who's the certain of the church? Verse 2. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Oh, John, he fell into this hardship. And there's nothing positive about it. It never showed that James said, praise God that I'm dying for Jesus Christ or God got the victory. There's no mention of that in the verse. No mention of that. God judged Herod at the end and gave victory to Peter escaping from prison. Nowhere for James. Nothing for James. He thought a life of feet from falling. Look at verse 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Peter was the one who got the victory. Peter was the one that got out. Peter was the one who received the positive blessing. I don't see anything about James right here. Why? That's what James is talking about. There's nothing you can do about it. If you just fall into it, you fall in. Wait, wait, uh, what, uh, what about my Bible reading, my prayer? And you're right, Bible reading, you can read that book all you want and there are times that will heal you, but let's just be honest, there are times it don't. But what about prayer? God's going to answer and do mighty things. You're right, you can pray, but you know there are just times that God's not answering it when you're praying. I went to council and then I got every advice and I tried all of it and I'm still in the dark. I'm still in that trial and you're right, you tried. The point is when you tried everything that you're supposed to do as a Christian and the right thing you're supposed to do, there are times you still cannot help you. And rather than being depressed about it, James says, when you tried everything and nothing happens, he says the opposite. That's exactly what God wants. Okay. Is when you tried everything and there's nothing you can do about it, that's what God wants. Right, right, right. And it's okay. It's okay. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah. That's what James is trying to say. Yeah. But I got to get out of this. You know, this is unhealthy. This is bad for me. No, God just wants you fall. Uh -huh. that's good. Why? Because you can't pick yourself back up, no matter how hard you try. And God wants you to, everything of yourself emptied, literally, totally nothing you can do about it. And God says, now there's nothing of you involved. I can step in. When you fall, God's the one who works out the problems and the details. So here we go. You know, you prayed, you read the Bible, you saw counsel, the right counsel, and you applied it, and you tried it, and here you are, you're still falling. And God's like, that's right, underneath my schedule and plan. Uh -huh. That's great. Wow. And here you go, day after day, week after week, month after month, and even years, and nothing happens, and God's like, oh, it's falling into place. I'm working something out. Behind the scenes, which you're not seeing, I'm turning it into something good. Behind the scenes, I'm building it up one by one. And as you're falling, God is working. That's good. But if you always pick yourself back up when you fall, you know, Bible reading, prayer, and some Christian to do, guess what? Uh, it's not going to last forever. You're not going to get yourself out of that. Amen. Now, it's true. Don't get me wrong. God wants you during trial and depression and suffering. You just need to follow spiritual principles. But God will also do this, is that when you tried every spiritual principle according to his word, he just wants you to finally just let it go. And just move on with life. Just do nothing. Okay. Nothing you can do about it. Look, it's a, as long as it's not a sin, it's okay. Nothing you can do about it and you cry. Someone dies, passes away. What are you going to do? Bible reading and prayer can't get that person back from the dead. Nothing you can do about it. As long as it's not sitting, just cry. It's okay. God understands. If you really have to lash out before you call down fire from heaven, it's okay to pour out the complaint to the Lord. It's okay to pour out the complaint to the Lord. What else can you do about it, huh? Keep pretending you're happy when you're not? 
Pour out the complaint to the Lord. Yes. It's okay to fall. Yes. You need to hear this. It's okay to fall. Yes. It's okay to fall. It's okay to fall. Because that's literally showing that there's nothing, absolutely nothing I can do about it. I give up. And God's like, yes. Yeah. When you give up yourself, I can step in yeah. and work good. something out. Notice that James, when we go back to the text, it says, when ye fall. That's why it says, ye fall, when you fall. Thank God that Gene Kim falls and God can get all the glory. Look at the last part of James 1, 2, the last part. When ye fall into what? Divers temptations. Divers temptations. My last point is the suffering, the suffering. We've looked at, first of all, the sympathy. Then we looked at the stance. We looked at the stumbling, which is when you fell. And now the suffering. Now, let me give you this question. Simple question, all right? Do you want satisfaction or misery? No brainer, right? Satisfaction. That's so obvious. Duh, I don't want misery. All right, now let me reword this question, okay? Do you want satisfaction or misery disguised as pleasure or reward? You might go, uh, I'm pretty sure I want satisfaction. <laughs> Because I know the misery disguised as reward, but see, it's only a disguise. It's not real. It's planning to give me misery. Well then, uh, why do you do that with sin? Okay. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. Why do you do that with your own ways of doing things in the flesh? It's all just a disguise. It's all just vain that, hey, this uh, alcohol, this liquor will please you. Going by your own plan and way is working. It will work. And no, there is only pleasure in sin for a season. It's vain. It's fantasy. It's false. It's a lie. It's a disguise. What did God promise? Your own way of doing things will bring misery. Period. Period. So then why choose misery? That disguises itself as reward, huh? Why do you keep choosing that? Don't you want satisfaction? Now let me reword it again. That way your eyes can open a bit. Do you want misery disguised as reward or satisfaction disguised as suffering? Wow. What would you like more? Did you get lost? Was that too deep for you? That's why I went step by step in the questions. Let me repeat again, okay? <laughs> Do you want misery disguised as reward or satisfaction disguised as suffering? That's why we don't choose satisfaction, happiness in the Lord, because of that disguise called suffering, sacrifice, hardship, my friend, uh, you got to realize that's just an outward veil. That's not the real thing. The real thing is all things work together for good. The real thing is I got a bigger blessing if you were to go through this suffering. But I can't give it to you until you go through it. I have a big plan for you. Take it to the next level. But see, we as human beings have to go by disguises because of our outward senses going by outward appearances. And that's how we judge things. You go by sight, taste, feeling, hearing. Disguise. That's why we always go by disguises. Judge things by disguises. Not by the real thing. Go to the book of Mark 10. Mark chapter 10. And then keep your hand at James 1. We're going to go back here again, all right? We're going to go to Mark 10 and James 1. Let's wrap things up right here. 
Mark chapter 10 and James 1. Now, this James and John, they asked Jesus, uh, Hey, can you give us the place to sit? One on your right hand and one on your left. And Jesus says, Hey, well, can you take the baptism of suffering then like I'm taking? No wonder James talks about suffering, right, later? Can you take it? James and John said, We can take it. Well, let's look at Mark 10. And let's look at Jesus' response to that. Notice that the Bible points out right here in verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would he that I do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what he asked. Can he drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. Okay, so Jesus says, All right, then you're going to go through it. So if they go through it, shouldn't they get it? No. <laughs> Verse 40, But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Now that is one of the meanest things Jesus can do. Can you imagine, you know, like, hey, I want, hey, Jesus, I want to sit on your right hand and on your left hand. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you have to go through the suffering that I go through. You really want that? Yes, Lord. Okay, you're going to get the baptism of suffering, but I'm still not going to give it to you. That is a mean thing to do. Who wants to give a person suffering? Only a madman would give someone suffering. And that's why a lot of people get bitter, mad, and even hate God or don't believe he exists. That's a cruel thing to do. I think James knew the reward. Do you realize it right here? Jesus knew that the better reward was not to, was not to sit on his right hand or his left hand. Get ready for this. You ready to hear this? The good thing that James got, the greatest thing James ever got was not the blessing, was not the reward, but the suffering. I see. Yeah. Now you might say, that does not make sense, Pastor. You're right, but James understood that. I think he understood when Jesus did that to him. Because go back to James 1. What did he say? He explains why it's good to fall into suffering. He never said, you know, the reward and the blessing and no, he said suffering. Why? Verse 2, fall into diverse temptations. Verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be what? Perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It's called satisfaction. Because you can get every blessing of God and still be dissatisfied. Okay. That's true. Isn't that true? Didn't you see how God blessed your life? How did God bless your life? You prayed for the blessing or you went through suffering to get the blessing and you got it. But why are you still not satisfied? Okay. Okay. Right there. That's true. Because blessing does not give the true satisfaction. Yeah. It's your maturity. That gives the real satisfaction. The spiritual maturity, the fullness of his growth, is where you finally get satisfied. James said that if you went through suffering, that's a wonderful thing because it's turning into satisfaction. That's the idea. It's called satisfaction disguised as suffering. And that's what God is trying to give to you is not the suffering, but the satisfaction part where you can be... Imagine a life. If I told you again... Do you want misery or contentment? You'd all say contentment. But to gain contentment, as James 1 said, you need to go through suffering. If I asked you, do you want misery or do you want satisfaction? All of you would say satisfaction. But you got to realize to get satisfaction, you go through suffering. If I were to ask you, do you want misery disguised as reward? Or satisfaction disguised as suffering. What would you choose? That's why we can accept 
the pain. Because we want every single human being, lost or saved, what, what they truly want in life is not all the blessing, all the riches, all the rewards, everything just right in this environment and everything just right in their life. No, you can have all the world but still have a dissatisfied hunger inside. The key that every single man, woman, child wants in this life is called satisfaction. That can only come through suffering. Here's the joy set before you. Will you come? Every head bow and every eye shut.